So, so just do the tutorials and you know, get up to speed and we'll have you get some scenes. So I was like, okay, cool. So I looked through the tutorials and you know, it, was, it was pretty thick stuff. And uh, I was looking around, okay, okay how am I going to get started here? I was looking around, I saw the keyboard, and I was looking around, I said, hey, hey. I called one of the guys over, you know, 3D guys, and I said, what's the matter? I said, I need to turn this thing off. <laughs> He's like, oh, dude, there's a box down here. You just push the button. He's like, oh, I didn't know it was down there. I thought it was all up here. You know? So powered it up and then uh, started. I ate a lot of aspirin because I had a lot of headaches, you know, learning that. It was a very steep learning curve. So uh, it, was, it was tough at first, but, you know, it's a great tool, man. There's so many cool things you can do. The, the two things you don't have to worry about anymore, obviously, are volumes. You track the volumes, the size, the character, and keeping it on model because it's always there. You know, it's consistency. So that's... Eliminated so you can focus more on the performance and stuff, which is cool, you know, it makes it a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't an easy transition. Also, another factor that made it difficult was at that time, Maya was a beta testing software, and a lot of bugs in it and stuff. They'd have a guy from Maya coming down all the time to fix stuff on the guy. And also, I found out when I was doing the tutorials, there were all these typos in the book. Like it would say, you can press these certain combination of buttons to get this effect, and I'd do it, and I'd be like, why isn't it working? And the guy would come over and say, oh yeah, that's a typo. Sorry, nobody <laughs> told you that. 
Thanks, where's the aspirin? I was going nuts trying to learn it in three months. A week or so. A little stressful, yeah. Now I hear there's a lot of cool plugins that you can use to make it a lot easier than what it was back then. So, is your process, your thought process for animation in 2D different than your thought process for 3D animation? No, not at all. It's, it's exactly the same. I, I, I try to apply as much as I can from uh, doing 2D because it really helps, you know, like uh, thumbnail sketches all, all up. Like I was just going to do a live demo here. Of, uh, I'm, I've got a dialogue scene here. I want to show you guys how I would approach it. You know, I do basically the same thing in CG. I would just block it out with poses. Uh, first, I thumbnail. Listen to the soundtrack. And then uh, do some thumbnail sketches to get some ideas down the page. And uh, mess with those a little bit, and then uh, go and start posing things out. In 2D, you just draw the poses, but in CG, I, I put it on step frame, and then just get these certain poses at certain points in the scene where I want to be, and then start throwing in the breakdown poses off of those. Keep it all in step as long as I could, and then when I got to the point where it was getting into more refined um, in betweens, I, I try not to let the computer do a lot of the in between much as possible. I try to keep as much control over it as possible because then it kind of gets floaty and it, it, the mathematics take over and it averages things out. I mean, you can go in the graph editor. The graph editor is your friend. <laughs> you can go in and tweak the curves and, you know, mess with things. And it's, it's really cool, I think. You know, it's, a, it's a really neat tool. Personally, I, I, I love 2D more only because when I got into the business, I, I always liked to draw, so that's why I, I really took that. And I, I've been lucky. I've been uh, I'm still doing stuff, freelance scenes on paper. We get to flip the paper and still do the drawings. It's kind of rare, you know, nowadays to do it on paper. Everybody wants it on the, the Cintiq and the Flash. And I'm very fortunate that way. Uh, I'm just going to, please feel free. I mean, this is very, very casual. If you guys have any questions about what's going on or uh, what I'm doing here, just to up and uh, let me know what I'm doing. What I'm going to do is just throw in this uh, real rough sketch of this character. What I've done here is I threw in the, the model sheet. I should turn off this thing to show you. Um, I threw in a model sheet under here. And this is a, a good technique in CG also. I mean, in 2D, what we do is we'll take a, a Xerox of the character from the model sheet and whatever pose is kind of close to what we're going to draw it in and see. And it will blow it up or reduce it down and, and try to fit it kind of the general placement where we're going to start animating. And use that as a reference so we can always keep track of the volumes. And in CG you can have, uh, you know, if there's a bunch of cool poses that somebody put together on like a, you know, a printout model sheet or something, you can import it and put it on another layer and keep it handy. And what I do is I put a little like, uh, like a, I don't know how to describe it, I call it a scrim, but it's like a little, almost like a sheet of tracing paper thrown over that. So it kind of dulls it down so when you draw over it, you know, you can, it's easier to differentiate what you're doing than what the, what the model sheet has on. So I'm going to just draw over here real quick to get the, pretend that he's sitting here listening to this other character talk, just so I have a little reference. Go by. First, I'm going to listen to the uh, <coughs> soundtrack. I'm going to listen to that real quick. Okay, let's give it a listen. Oh, it's too loud. <laughs> I 
just realized he's saying triple dog to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, Mike. <laughs> I'm triple dog, Darian. Okay. Now, this is a stage that a lot of people rush through. They're like, hey, I know, I know what you're doing. <laughs> and I like to like listen to it, close my eyes, and try to use your imagination, visualize what you would picture him doing this dialogue. And when I listen to it, I'm, I'm trying to listen to certain parts that are emphasized, like you're going to say something like, you, come over here, you can say it so many different ways, like I can say, you, come over here, or you, come over here, or you, come over here, or you, come over here, you know, there's so, so many different ways to say it, and it affects the performance. So I'm trying to listen to I'm the accents. I'm triple dog Darian. I'm triple dog Darian. I'm envisioning when he says, a triple dog dare you. He's going to lean forward and do something with his arm to emphasize that. So he's leaning forward. I want to start with him in the opposite pose, like leaning back, because I want a nice change of shape. So I'll have him start with this one. Changed his body shape from the beginning here over here. It's, it's leaning forward, it's and just little thumbnail scratches, just notes for yourself. You don't have to go on fancy. Yeah. Now these are just you know quick notes. You can when you go to actually do the full size poses, you can. I said, like, if you, like the way the assistant embellishes, you can embellish as you go from the thumbnail stage into the poses.
Yeah, if I had a 3D model I was going to work with, I'd do the same thing, but I'd do it on a sheet of paper mm -hmm. on my desk. I'd sit there and thumbnail out, listen to the soundtrack over and over, and thumbnail it out. Or if it's an action scene uh, with no dialogue, I'd still try to I'd look at the length of the scene, if it's like 48 frames or 9 frames, you know, I've got, I've got a very short time frame to work with. I try to uh, whip out some poses that, uh, if it, the shorter the scene is, the more clear you have to be, it's going to be so brief, so if they kind of push things even further. If you've got a really long scene, you can get a little more subtle because it will get up on the screen a lot longer and we'll make a good look at it. I'm just going to use this one. No, I've read in animation books that the animation is done. I mean, that's all the work there. But that's all the thought process. The thumbnails? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the rest great. is just work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the rest is, is just doing drawings. <laughs> well, in, in some ways that's true. I mean, this is the creative process, right? You're, you're figuring it out, you're imagining it, you're envisioning it, you're putting it down. So that's the creation part. But, like I said, when you go to do the full-size poses, I'm going to try and show that here, where instead of just following these verbatim, you can push it even further. You can alter things. I don't think I like the hat that way. I like it over here better. Or you can, you know, experiment and try different different things to see what kind of silhouette you get and stuff like that. So, so gonna, can you talk us uh, through just a little bit more about why you created those size poses? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me just listen to you and I'll explain what I'm here. I Okay. When he says there's an emphasis on trample. I trampled on Daria. Those are the two spots that seem to be the biggest accent. So one thing you try to not to do in, in a scene is try try not to repeat the same things over and over and try to get as much texture and variation in the scene as you can because it's more aesthetically pleasing to watch because you can see there's variations going on. If you, if you do the same thing over and over, it gets monotonous and repetitive and it gets kind of boring for the, for the performance and for the viewer. So I tried to figure out what kind of, first I tried to figure out what he's going to do when he says triple and what I'm going to do, like each one of these poses has to relate to the other. So. If he's going to say triple, like he's, he's straining a little bit, like he's stretching up, he's, he's doing something. But on Derry, I wanted him to do something with his arm. So instead of going, I triple dog Derry, that'd be bad, because he's doing the same thing over and over. So instead of just doing that, I go, well, I want to put a variation. So I go, I triple dog Derry. So I'm having to do one accent going up, and then he's going to do this thing and then recoil or settle afterwards. So. Uh, in order to get him up into this pose for triple, I've got to start him down. So he's kind of more of a neutral pose. But I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to have him when he lean back because he's going to be leaning forward later on. So again, there's another change. You know, change of shape and gesture that makes it more interesting in silhouette wise. So all the choices you're making there are based off of the animation principles, right? Yeah, yeah. These are all principles. <laughs> Keep in mind, you know, I heard there were 12. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? I heard there were 12. There's 12. There's 12. Oh, there's, there's more than that. <laughs> There's, there's all these basic, have you guys seen the Richard Williams DVD sets that go with his book? Have you seen that? They had like 28 principles. Oh, I, I, I never counted them, but uh, he, he said at the end of the, he had this big long master class, right? I don't know how many DVDs are, what, 14, 15? It's a whole big box set. And I watched all of them, I was like, yeah, this is great, you know, I, I, he's covering all the basics. And then he gets to the end and he says at, at one of his lectures, his master classes, this gal came up to him, and said, oh, Richard, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed your, your class. And I was just wondering one thing. He goes, what's that? He says, when are you going to get to the advanced stuff? I want to learn the advanced stuff. That's all great, the basics and all. When are you going to get to that? He says, what do you mean? That's it. <laughs> he says, these are all the basics. And he says, when you take all those basics and put them all together, and it's what you do with it, you know, that makes it advanced. Like I said, you know, like that, you start out with a bouncing ball and you add things. That's what Richard Williams likes to do. He likes to add all these details. But he goes crazy, he goes even further. He adds as much stuff in it as he can. Only, only to the point where it's almost too much, you know. But he, he just loves it so much. He loves the process of going in there and adding and changing and fixing and rearranging things. But uh, that, that's really, you know, how to get to the advanced stuff is it's all the basics all put together. Uh, when I was at Disney, they had these talks during lunchtime, and Mark Penn was one of the supervising animators of Mermaid. He said, "We're gonna we're gonna cover today just the basics because I'm noticing a lot of you guys don't have all of them in there." And we're like, "What? You know, we know the basics. Come on, you're wasting our time." And it was really really good to for him to do that because there's so many of them. You know, like they said, there's like 15, 28. There's, there's quite a few. 
that being reminded of all made us wake up and wow, yeah, you're right, I don't put enough arcs in there, I don't put enough squash and stretch or, or slow ins and slow outs and variation in timing. So all these things even add up to, to making it look really sweet. I mean, you guys know the Preston Blair book? The, yes. In the back, there's a one page somewhere that uh, says like pointers on animation to remember and there's like seven or eight of them, I think, or maybe ten, but man, if you just use it as like a checklist, and go down and see, do I have a good clear silhouette? Do I have good squash and good, you know, good arcs? All these things overlap, follow through, all these things that he covers. If all that's in there, it looks beautiful. It's just gorgeous. Any any film you like, whether it's, it could be CG, 2D, stop motion, anything. I mean, there's stuff in The Incredibles I just think is incredible. <laughs> there's one scene where he, the Mr. Incredible goes to visit Edna Mode, and he's talking to her about making a new costume. And this scene stands out to me every single day. It's beautiful. I don't know who did it. i got to find out. It's Ed Tosh. I'm like, no, because he knows some Pixar cats up there. But there's one scene. He's sitting in a chair, and they're talking. She's getting out her pen. She you know, clicks it and goes, OK, no capes. And he's like, oh, yeah, but wait a minute. This one had a cape. And he was cool. Oh, and he, he gets up in his seat, and he goes like this. Oh, man, he's such a good look. You know, he puts his shoulder and does this thing with his hand. I'm like, that's sweet. Somebody is like observing, you know, people at a party talking about stuff. And you observe people and how they how they behave, and you get all these little quirky nuances things. Then he exaggerated it, you know, by really twisting the body. It's just beautiful, nice stuff, man. I just, I just love it. Such a geek. I just like. I just. I've got I've got a thumbnails here. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a total geek. I mean, uh, I just went to Denmark to teach a class over there at that door. A friend of mine has been a teacher over there for years and he asked me to come over. We had this big talk where the whole school came in and he, we treated it like an interview. We sat in a couple chairs and he was talking to me and uh, he said, uh, what's the geekiest thing you've ever done as an animator? And I said, oh, that's a good question. I never really thought about it before until he asked that. And uh, I, I told him, I said, the geekiest thing I think I've ever done was I, I would take some Xerox flip that I like got from Vantage or Nokia or something. And uh, I, I knew that in order to get, because I couldn't afford a pencil test system back then, in order to get a feeling, the correct feeling for the timing, I knew that I had to flip those papers at a certain speed to emulate 24 frames per second going by, right? You know, the speed of like the old flip book where I was doing big sheets. So I said I popped in Pinocchio and watched the video and got right to the scene of the exact scene I had the pencil test Xerox is from. And I'd play it over and over, I get the remote and I get it ready, I pause it, and then I hit play. And when it played, I tried to flip it at the exact same speed as the video. <laughs> so I get used to, you know, how fast do I have to do this to emulate 24 frames a second so I don't have to have a pencil test? And I said, dude, that is the geekiest thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm like, that is pretty geeky, you know, but I looked. Yeah, did it work? It worked, yeah. Okay. In fact, See, that's important. In fact the, the result of, of forcing myself to learn that speed, I, again, I didn't have a pencil test system, right? And on the uh, Chuck Jones stuff with the coyote, they gave me this, I don't even know how I got the freelance to a friend or something. They, they said, oh, okay, we're going to give you a batch of scenes, and the coyote can do them and bring, bring the test back in. So I'm like, I'm flipping it, I'm flipping it right at the speed. <laughs> and I'm looking, I go, yeah, that looks like it works, looks like it works, God, I hope it works. <laughs> so I, I handed it in, I'm like, oh my God, what are they going to say? They're going to say, oh, it's too slow, it's too fast, or you're too lame, or whatever. And I got a phone call, and the guy said, the producer says, yeah, Chuck Jones took a look at your uh, test, and uh, he really liked it. He said you really captured the old, uh, you know, coyote stuff. And he said, well, "Can you start Monday?" I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh my God, you know, one of the, my heroes. And I was like, blown away that practicing that helped. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it, it, it helped out. <laughs> and we would we would go frame by frame to the entire feature. Any any parts that we thought were cool, we were like, stop it, stop it, go back, go back. And we sit there and see, look at that, look what's going on. Oh, dude, it's just crazy. It's <laughs> really, really getting into it. That goes for anything. I do the same thing with Coraline. I look at Coraline. Oh my 
I'm noticing it can be a little off balance. I'm just playing in this first pose based on the model sheet to think of the size and that the coordinate structure of the area for the back to the front of the Keep in balance is another thing. You gotta watch out. There's like a, a center line for it. The character's too far to the left, I feel like it's far over this way, too far to the right, I feel like it's far on the left. So. Okay, so there's my basic first pose. Since it's on by itself or something. Oh man, it's turned up full blinds. That's weird. Oh. Huh. Yeah, well, I remember what he said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he says, I tripled on you, so first his mouth is not even open. Actually. He shouldn't even have it Now what I'm thinking when I, when I do this head angle is when he leans forward, his head is going to be uh, leaning forward too a little bit. So I want to, or actually lean back, I'm sorry, he goes forward and the head goes back and I'm posing a little bit. So when I lean him up, I want it to tilt down forward like this in anticipation to, to tilt that way. So the head goes up. His head will tilt slightly down like this. And usually on the, if you do it on paper, or even in here, I try to uh, write in the dialogue as a reference so I know what I'm doing where. So if he says I, this is the I triple dot area. Nice to have his eyes closed too. You suppose if I quit out of the program, re opened it back up, it would reset the audio? Maybe. When you uh, open up the volume, you're supposed to hear like a little ding, 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 ding. Right yeah. It's not even doing it computer. Yeah, it's not. Well, then there's another little uh, speaker icon, the red one, next to that little Spartan shield thing. Yeah, check that. Right. Sound manager? Press OK. Pretty much. Okay. 
<laughs> now that I listen to that dialogue, it really seems like his mouth is much more open than his wire. When the, the sound starts, uh, there's been different theories about how to do lip sync. Like uh, some people say, oh, you got to have the mouth shape hit two frames ahead of the actual sound, right? And every time I try that, my directors are always say, dude, it sounds like it's out of sync. It's too far ahead. So I try to, you know, afterwards, before I tried everything, and, and I found that the thing that works the best is to put it right on the button for the mouth shape. But because the body language is so powerful, you kind of want to set up the, the audio sound, the, the dialogue accent, by getting the body there a couple frames ahead, sometimes even four or five frames ahead of time. Like I've noticed, you guys know who James Cagney is, right? Jim Cagney, the old uh, actor. He'd sit there and he'd deliver a line and he'd go, You dirty rat! But he'd get his hand out there way before he said it. You, know? you dirty rat! Oh, we're going to shoot you! It's just, the way he delivers stuff, it's really fun. Make sure he telegraphs so that you know what he's going to do before he says it. So I'm trip. I'm going to get him in that just before he gets the trip for the body of the See, already I've added another pose here. Instead of him getting up here on triple, I've got him up there on I. I, and now that he's up there, I'm going to have him change to this. Triple up. Throw his head up. Still with his eyes closed. This is where he's at. The little skew as his head comes back. His head moves further than the half does. Let's his chest flare up before he comes down. And I try to get a rhythm through the whole body whenever I can, like if he's uh, going to pump up his chest like that, I try to get the uh, sweep through the body like this. Just let the arm come up even further now. So I'm like this.
this back to right a little bit. So it's watching paint dry. <laughs> <laughs> single line, just try to you know, feel around and get really messy with it. And, and always decipher lines out of that. It like, gives you more choices. Here's a real nice little sketch made in the tray. Really good, one, yeah. really good solid drawing, nice yeah. perspective. And this helps you out. I mean, the better you can do this, the easier it is for you to pose your CG model. I mean, it's, it's, it's all done, you know, like you are saying. It's all pre-planned and figured out. Hmm. And you can sometimes get a really stick figure. So I like to show this one because it's got rough scribbly in and then the other end on the left is all uh, you know, just thrown down really quick. Just a few lines here and there and it communicates so much it's easy to move around. There's the light on bulb mount to see if it's rough out there. There's a really good one. It's simple. And yet it's so powerful. So 
So I wanted to show you guys some flash files, flash files that I dissected here. Now this one is something I did with another AI class. Where I animated just this body movement. Trying to envision how would a bird move this body when it's black on its wings. I just try to keep it as simple as possible, a little circle for the head and body shape. And I went ahead and added the wings in there. I tried to get those work one at a time. You know, I did, I did them in separate colors so I could keep track of them on that layer. And I put in the expression for a patch on his eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little tail. This is where Richard Williams loves to You can do anything now. Just anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had a little leg movement in there. Now it's starting to look kind of involved, and there's a lot of things going on. So after working this all out individually, when you go to do the, the tied down drawing over the top of this, and just you know, take each image and go right over. Cigar, bless you. Thank you. Look at this cigarette in his mouth. Good measure. This is how James Baxter works. I don't know if you've seen the first pass, but he supposedly does a little stick figure type things like this. I was just trying to imagine how I've seen people smoke and take a big drag. And I could scream over that and start to draw over it. new drawings have to relate to each other too. So in a way you're kind of recreating the drawing but just putting more thought into it as far as the silhouette between the fingers and the body. Slowing the that. Perhaps it about this quite a bit. He says that when uh, the, the real important drawings or poses in any scene are the breakdown poses. So just to show you how uh, varied these things can be, I went and did a whole bunch of different levels with different examples of how to break down from this pose to that pose, right? Just a little change in expression. So there's so many different ways to get there. So I, I tried different ones to illustrate the students just how uh, makes a big difference in the feel of it. There's one way, there's another one. Another. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, I was so excited when I saw Ratatouille and the squash and stretch that they got on it. Sometimes you'll get um, 
uh, shows the uh, weight of all the stick figures. I think I started out at first with just this one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and then this one. Those are the four major poses. And I went ahead and added all these different anticipations in there. Like from here, to get down to gravity right there, he actually goes, he actually anticipates down before he anticipates up, and then goes down to gravity. And then, anticipates down again, and then lets the lower body lead the way, and then the arms drag. And then there's a little twist of the arms, which I noticed in like, the Olympics, they do that. It's big heavy weight. It's up, and then the center's down on his chest. And from there, they pause for a bit, anticipate down, and then do the final push up. So easy to figure this stuff out. Uh, here's a, something that's straight ahead. It shows how much fluidity you can get without even posing it. You just go straight ahead and animate it. You get some pretty nice effects with action. In general, you're supposed to pose for acting. So you want to get certain expressions and gestures, but in straight ahead, you use it more for action, like running, jumping, dancing. It's perfect. Oh, I got some. Uh, <laughs> you might want to turn the camera off for this. I got some.